prior procedures, I was just telling you, I'm, I'm watching these videos of structure and interpretation of computer programs. It's um, it's it's from like the 80s, and it's like, it's it was taught by these two professors, like Adelman and Sussman uh, at MIT, and it's one of those books that like, like you hear about it all the time on like on, on like blogs and stuff, and um, it's the course was actually in Lisp. And when I was watching these, like I, I like it just blew my mind, like um, just um, like what he does with Lisp, and just like I don't know, it's it's old, but like it's still totally relevant, especially to Ruby today. And so, um, and so I've been doing this stuff on higher order procedures. This is basically taken like straight from one of the chapters of the book. And so, like I'm sure all of you guys have you know come across it using like lambdas one time or another. So. Probably a lot of the stuff won't be like super new, but um, I don't know. Just the way that he presented it is uh, was really interesting to me. So um, I guess we can talk about that. Yeah. If you guys want to, we can talk about it if you want. No, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So basically, um, higher order procedures in Ruby. Again, this I didn't I didn't write this. I basically converted a chapter of uh, <laughs> structure and interpretation um, and converted this stuff to Ruby. You can get the video lectures online. I highly recommend them. I think if I ever, uh, you know, like, get to be like head of a department, then totally be something that'd be like highly recommended, like watching for pretty much anyone in my department. Um, so that's just like legal stuff. The it's Creative Commons. Um, so that's it. So basically, when we're talking about mathematical procedures here, so just mathematical, not manipulating strings or whatever. Um, mathematical procedures are basically, in effect, they are abstractions, and they define, they describe compound operations on numbers, and it's independent of the particular numbers. You know, so for example, when we define this this procedure cube, we're not talking about the cube of a particular number, like the cube of three or something, but rather um, a method for obtaining the cube of any number. Um, so you know, if we have a, it's a times a times a. So, of course, we could get along without um, ever defining this procedure by always writing expressions like this and never mentioning cube specifically. You know, we do 3 times 3 times 3, x times x times x, whatever. You never mention cube, but that would really place us at like a serious disadvantage because, you know, as you can see here, like it forces us to work at the level of the operations that are just primitives of this language, and um, which is like multiplication in this case. You know, our programs can compute cubes, but they lack the ability to express the concept of cubing. Um, so obviously one of the things that we should demand from a powerful programming language is the ability to kind of build these abstractions by assigning names to our common patterns. And then we want to work in terms of those abstractions directly. And so, you know, obviously as you guys know, procedures provide this ability. So, it's obvious for you know for writing procedures we need num more than numbers for parameters. You know we're not even though in the stuff that we do every day we need more than numbers for parameters, and you know often the same programming pattern if we if we use that over and over um, we'll use those same patterns those indicate concepts and um, you know you'll use those same patterns in a number of different procedures, and so basically. You know, to express these patterns as concepts, we need to construct procedures that can accept procedures as arguments and also return procedures um, as their output. So, in the same way that we um, that we need more than numbers for parameters, we can also, like for functions, we can also pass strings and objects. But real power comes when we start using procedures themselves as parameters to other procedures. Um, procedures that manipulate other procedures are called higher order procedures. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna um, kind of talk about how higher order procedures are a powerful abstraction that we can use that will really increase um, the expressive power of your language. So here's some examples. Um, first, we compute the sum of the integers from A through B. So, um, here. here we go. So the sum of the integers A and B, this is a recursive procedure. So basically what we want to say is return zero if A is greater than B. Otherwise, return A plus the sum of the integers plus the same function itself to A plus one and then B. 
And so you can see right here, we're incrementing A each time that brings us closer to our terminating condition, you know, one of the requirements of a recursive procedure. And so basically, so it's just recursive procedures when we say some of the integers of 1 through 10, so that's like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, you know, and you get 55. Does that make sense when you say, mm -hmm. okay. Um, the second computes the sum of the cubes of the integers in the given range. So again, we see the sum of cubes of a and b returns 0 if a is greater than b. Otherwise, return cube, that function that we defined earlier, you know, a times a times a, plus the sum of cubes, the same function, a plus 1 and b. And sum of the cubes plus 1 from 1 to 3, you know, 1, 2, and 3 is 36. So that's like 9 plus 4. Wait, that's not right. Wait, oh, the cube, sorry. The cubes, not the square, sorry. Yeah, it's 36. I checked the spell, I promise. <laughs> So the third um, computes the sum of the sequence of terms in the series, you know, 1 over 1 times 3 plus 1 over 5 times 7 plus 1 over 9 times 7, which converges to pi over 8 very slowly. So, you know, we can find this much like the others. Pi sum returns 0 phase greater than b, and then we do, we do all this, and, you know, um, and call it back on itself. And so you can see if we pi sum from 1 to 1,000, and then we times that times 8, you see it converges to pi over 8. We have 3.1395. <coughs> okay. So if you look at these three procedures, you, you can see that they all share um, a common underlying pattern. You know, for the most part, they differ only in um, the name of the procedure, the function that's used to compute the next term to be added, and the function that, um, that returns, you know, it provides the next value of A. So we could generate each of these procedures by filling in the slots of some template that would look like this, you know, define the name of A and B, return A, 0, A, 3, and B, the next term, plus myself, and the next A, and then B. So the presence of such a pattern is strong evidence that there's like a useful abstraction here that's just longing to be brought to the, to the surface. Mathematicians long ago, um, they, they identified um, the abstraction of summation and invented sigma notation, and that's what you have here, to express you know, the concept of summation. And the power of sigma notation is that it allows mathematicians to deal with the concept of summation rather than only with you know, particular sums. So, for example, you can formulate general results about sums um, that are independent of the particular numbers that are being summed, or the particular series that's being summed. Um, so similarly, as program designers, we want our language to be powerful enough so that we can write a procedure that expresses the concept of summation itself rather than only procedures that compute particular sums. So basically we can do this in Ruby by taking the template shown, uh, shown above and transforming these slots into formal parameters. So you can see what we have here is we have define sum to be this first term which is a procedure which we'll get more into. A the next procedure, which returns the next term, and then B. Um, and so you can see return zero if A is greater than B, same as our template above, and then we say term, which is a procedure, call that procedure with the value of A, and then call sum, our same thing, with the function that we're talking about, the next call A, because remember we always need to, we need to like get the next A, if you leave it the same you'd have an infinite loop. Um, so we always want, want to have a moving closer to our terminating condition every time. Um, so use the next procedure to get the next A, pass in the procedure that we just called over here, and then pass in B. So let's see how this can actually be used. So let's define uh, some cubes. All we have to do is um, define this increment method. So if we want to increment N, so let's say we have like 5, you know, this will return 6. So to define the sum of cubes like we had earlier, so the sum of cubes a and b is cube, we want, what we want is a procedure here, so we say self.method and the method named cube, which is some, the method we defined earlier at the very beginning, remember? And then you say two proc. And then we, here we do the same thing for the increment. We say self method increment two proc, and which is this right here. So this trigger right here, basically what this is saying is, you know, on yourself, get the method named Q, and then convert it to a proc object, so then we can kind of pass it around. And I'll talk more about proc objects um, a little bit later on. And then basically you just call the sum of Q, A, E, and B. So you pass in these two procedures as arguments. We're actually passing in whole functions as arguments, basically, procedures. 
And you can see that when we call some cues, one to three, 36, the same result that we would expect. So we're taking the procedure and we're passing it as an argument, just like it's another piece of data. Same thing, with the help of an identity function, we can do the sum of the integers. So we say right here, um, sum of the integers a and b. The id <coughs> function is the identity function. The increment function is the same increment function we just had. And then you call it the same thing, sum with the functions and here are the arguments. So the sum of the integers from 1 to 10 um, is 55. And it works exactly like we would think. Um, again, Python is the exact same thing. Um, using the so we can do the exact same thing. We define this pi term of x and then the pi next of x. We just pass them in and then we get the same, uh, the same result. But see, rather than defining pi next and pi term, um, it would be more convenient if we had a way to directly specify, you know, the procedure that returns its input incremented by 4, which would be this right here. And if we could also say, you know, the procedure that returns the reciprocal of its input times its input plus 4, uh, plus 2, sorry. So we can do this by introducing the special form of lambda, which basically creates procedures. You know, we don't actually have to define these methods. We can use lambda to define them right when we need them, because they're so small, you, you we're only maybe needing them in like one place. So with lambda, we can do what we want. So for instance, in this case, the procedure that returns its input incremented by four, we just say lambda, and then you pass it a block, and then you have this right here is like, um, this, this proc object would take x as an argument, and then return the value of x plus four. So what lambda, yeah, what lambda does in Ruby is it returns basically a proc object, which is basically a procedure that's wrapped as an object. And as an object, we can pass it around, um, pass it around just like any other object. And this is exactly the feature that we want to explore. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Okay. And at the OC Ruby one a few months ago, we had a discussion. Is there a difference between using lambda versus proc.new? There is. But I don't know. It's it's really that's what the conclusion we came to. Yeah. No one it understood. Does it have to do with, um, with uh, local scope? Like like one it's of the like local returns or something? It's like in your, when you're inside of the block, if you do like a return, uh -huh. um, it differs from depending on how you, on how you, so and lambda, and all I know is that lambda is the best way to do it. I know the lambda is the best way to do it. It's supposed to be frack lambda, right? Okay. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the program in Ruby book. Yeah, if you look up, there's like a section, there's like three different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, you can also be like, it's, like, it's, like, like, it's like where it's returned, like what context it's returned. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I can't, yeah. can't remember. Yeah, I actually don't understand if you'll be like, it makes sense to keep it without drinking beer. It makes more sense to keep it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And there's, you know, there's a lot of details too about like doing the like, procs or whatever, like using the proc objects. And there's more like technical details to do it. But yeah, the focus for this is just to get us to be able to like think in these terms of higher order procedures um, in, in basically any language that supports it, you know. Um, and so also too, if we want to have, you know, the same procedure, the procedure that returns the reciprocal of its input, um, with its input times its input plus two. Um, and so basically, we can define pi sum to be that same thing. So instead of having to define, define those two methods, you can just say pi sum is the sum of this lambda, a and b, and then this lambda. So um, yeah, here's another example of a lambda for those anyone who wasn't too familiar with it. Basically, when you have right here, um, so define n times a thing. And you can return lambda of n, and then return a thing times n. Um, so if we say p1 equals n times 23, then 23 becomes a thing, right? So then it returns a procedure that takes, whoops, <laughs> sorry. Um, it returns a procedure that takes an argument, which is this n. So right here when we say p1.call3, then that three gets transmitted into this n, and then returns a thing, which is 23 times three, which is 69. If we say p.call4, it turns 92. Um, as an aside, 
I consider this to be one of the warts of Ruby. Um, the fact that you can't treat P1 as a true procedure, you actually have to call P1.call, which means you have to know that it's a proc object. Whereas like in Lisp, it's, you just treat the procedure, like it's a procedure, it's data, like you don't know. Yeah. Same in like JavaScript, you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can just use the procedure with like, you know, ideally you just want to say P1, open parentheses, three, close parentheses. Hopefully it'll be fixed in the next version of Ruby, but... What's supposed to be? I don't know, there's been a lot of discussion on it. Because <laughs> like, it has to do with like, the way like the Bison interpreter, or like how Lexer and Parser works, and I don't know. I don't oh, okay with that call. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh... The cool thing about this is that you can say P2 equals n times hello space, and in Ruby, if you if you like times a string, then it'll just repeat it. So you can say p2.call3, hello, hello, hello. And so you notice that we're passing in two totally different objects, an integer and a string, and it's still uh, the lambda that we get returned still returns uh, both times. So I don't know. I, like, it's a super simple example, but it's like such a powerful concept. So basically, the above example just demonstrates the ability to pass procedures as arguments, um, but we can achieve even more expressive power, like the previous example, by creating procedures that whose return values are themselves procedures. So like, let's say we want to filter out the even numbers in a list. So this procedure takes a list, and it returns a new list containing the even numbers. So we say, is it even? We define a function even. So we say, i modulo 2 equals 0, and then it's even. So filter evens the list. We make a new list to store stuff up in. We say for each element in our list, you know, loop through the element, push it on the new list if it's even. Pretty straightforward. And then you return the new list. So if we run that on filter evens, one through eight, and we get two versus eight. Pretty straightforward. But later on, we might want to filter by odd numbers, or by phone numbers, or by prime numbers. Um, what we need is a way to express the concept of filtration. And so that's what this, this function does, make filter. And basically, you know, a predicate is like a logic function that will return, you know, true or false. So this function make filter returns a lambda. So it returns a function, that's what's in this block, that given a list, it says, so it does the same thing, create a new empty list for list dot, for each element in the list that is passed in, take each element, push onto the new list if the predicate, if you call the predicate on the element and that's true, and then return the new list. So does that make sense here? Mm -hmm. So you're passing in the predicate, call the predicate, and then return the function that calls that predicate. Um, and so if we say filter odds equals make filter, we pass in a lambda, which in this right here says um, take i, and if i modulo 2 is not equal to 0, so if it's odd, then that's our function. That's our function that determines if it's, you know, this returns true or false based on if a function is odd. So to kind of walk through it, that's the predicate. So then when we come in here, this lambda function becomes this predicate function. So filter odds is now a lambda expression, a proc object, that we can then call on some list. And so then you can see on our same one, oh, well, I guess this list is probably has more because it has nine. Plus one, you got one, three, five, and seven. So we're actually passing in a procedure as an argument and then returning a procedure. Um, this can be used on other data. I don't know if you guys have seen Ruby Facets, but it's a it's an interesting library. There's a lot of different things on there, and what one of the things is you can have like an ordinal um, for an integer. So we can say ten dot ordinal returns like ten. So you have like first, second, third, or whatever. That's like the ordinal version of the of the number. And so then let's say we want to say filter ths, like all of the things that end in th. Then we basically call make filter with a function that says um, it calls the integer and says the integer ordinal version. Does that match, you know, does that end in th? That regular expression is like, you know, the anchor to the end and it ends in th. Return true if it does, otherwise return false. So then if we say filter this call on the list, we get four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which would be like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You don't get first because that ends in st or whatever. And so it's um, it's a really powerful way for us to, to abstract this concept of filtration. Um, so basically, as programmers, just to wrap it up, 
we need to be alert to opportunities to identify these underlying abstractions in our programs and build upon them to create more powerful abstractions. Um, because these abstractions are very powerful. But you also need to be appropriate. I mean, this isn't to say that we should write programs in the most abstract way possible. You know, expert programmers know how to choose the level of abstraction that's appropriate for the task at hand. But it's important to be able to think about, um, to think in terms of these abstractions so that you can apply them in the new context. Um, and so, the significance of hierarchy is that it enables to represent these abstractions um, explicitly as elements of our programming language so that they can be handled um, just like other computational elements. So, that's it. Cool. The procedural uh, programming is uh, it's like almost, it's almost very different to me, you know, it's like, I think very object oriented, you know, mm. but, um, yeah, like Erlang, and, uh, um, yeah, the, have you guys read the, um, Joel and Software, uh, thing about map reviews? This totally reminds me of that, you know, the user is like passing around procedures and iterators and, I like that. One of the guys in Rails Conf was Avi Bryant, the small font guy. Okay. He did Dabble Bee. And he wrote mm -hmm. like, this web framework that's the opposite of Rails. <laughs> Instead of a shared like nesting architecture, it's all based on closure, which are just like the land that. You know, mm -hmm. One of the more interesting things about defining the crop or anything like that is you're capturing the scope that you then, that lives forever inside that world. Like when you, right. in, in any of these examples, whenever you pass something into that land, like, and it lives in there, and you know, you can pass it around forever. Right. And so what they're doing is just capturing that state in the virtual, in the small talk virtual machine and like it gives you a goopy URL instead of a pretty one. And all that does is it enters you back into the exact same process environment you just left. Like, Interesting. Left. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how Rails is stupid. And <laughs> 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 Ruby is just um, small talk 20 years ago. It was a great talk. <laughs> yeah, it was a keynote. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> You, yeah, you have that closure property here because, like, because like this this lambda function lives on for the time that you call this function right here, even though like it's outside of this block. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and you can pass that around forever. It's there. Like, the reference is able where the, the variable persists inside the lambda even when it goes out of scope outside. You want to have a Think. Yeah, I think. Oh, and uh, I think I know the difference actually. I think if you were to do like a return in a lambda right here, it returns to this. But if you do a proc object, maybe if you do like proc.new and you do like return up there, it'll actually return out of whatever method this is in. Uh, I think. I think. I think maybe I. I don't look that up. But. That's cool. Yeah, it's fun. It's amazing. Man. How much you can make Ruby do your make your own syntax? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the way you explained too, where you, you fill in the slots. Yeah. Those were was it? Were there lispy examples of the bring the backtick thing? Where was the, the source material? Did they did they do lisp examples where they like do the back tick thing? Because like that Sometimes. that helped me understand um, when to do it. You know, right. Like when like when like exactly like you showed it is like. When when am I when could this be a variable? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when magically, if it could magically be a variable, when would, when would I make it one? Yeah, that was really good. Well, thanks, I totally ripped it off. <laughs> <laughs> did, did that guy, uh, the small talk guy, his criticism of Rails, did, was there anything interesting in it? Like, did it hold any water? Or? Um, it did while he was on stage. Okay. He was very convincing. Um, was it yeah, like Seascape or something? Or uh, is that Seaside. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it is. It's really cool. And, and his point was that like the Ruby interpreter is basically a dog, you know. And then Smalltalk guys twenty years ago set out to solve the exact same problem. But his biggest complaint, which I think holds yeah. a lot of water, is like you if you're debugging Ruby and you want to like debug each, right? You can't because it's C. It's not Ruby. In Smalltalk, mm -hmm. every he could sync turtle all the way down. So like everything from the basic primitives in small talk or minor small talks are in small talk. Mm -hmm. But then there are like fifty million different small talk implementations mm -hmm. that are awkward. Right. So that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. He, he glossed over it. And he kept talking <laughs> about like he's like scaling so like Seaside shares everything, right? So right. Then, like, my brain is like, yeah, we put computer number two, great. <laughs> right. Website number two. 
Uh, but he would, he just kept glossing over by saying there's a company in Portland called what was it called Gemstone. Yeah. They make a, a small talk interpreter that will distribute itself over a network of machines yeah, that yeah, up to four terabytes. They can keep in four memory. terabytes of in memory. In memory. Right. Oh, and I'll just do it for you. It's magic. Forever. Forever. Yeah, forever and ever. This is the Wall is it Street. Source? Yeah. Uh, no. No, 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 no. It sounds like it was about a billion dollars, but yeah. <laughs> he just kept saying that. One of the interesting things I liked about Smalltalk is um, like I was interested in writing a Ruby refactoring browser. And um, and uh, <coughs> inspired by the Smalltalk refactoring browser, because it's like when you edit in Smalltalk, like, uh, I don't know, there's like a small talk editor that like everybody uses or something, and it yeah, actually yeah. keeps like a database of all of your languages. So if you s select like a variable and you're like, oh, change this variable name, like it doesn't do like a regular expression find yeah, replace. It, 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 like, it's alive. Yeah, right? it, like, it's you know, there's variables. Yeah, it's crazy. I thought that was like really cool. But then, the then oh, it's yeah. funny because like everyone like sat through this talk and we're like, whoa, we had like 1,600 people there, and some of whom were relatively smart. And we were all sitting there, I think everyone was like, holy shit. But one of the first questions was like, okay, so I lose Unix, I lose, everything's a file. What do you do for like source control? He's like, uh, that was one of the first things I had to do when I started doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 like, and they're like, so it works? He's like, yeah, it works pretty well. Wait, you can't just use subversion? <laughs> well, it's, it's, like it's a, a binary image, image, right? Yeah. That's yeah. it. Oh, so wow. like, like yeah. you know, yeah. if you're sharing, and so I don't know how to do it. It's called Monticello. And it's, uh, but yeah, it's funny because everyone was like, <gasps> during the talk, and then afterwards, like, wait. Like my text editor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the text editor seems a little weird. You have to use the text editor, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, you're not using yeah. text, it's yeah. like you're editing data. Yeah, data yeah. and code, yeah, it's like the same. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's a little bit of my editor. I haven't played with it. It is cool. Like, yeah. If anybody has like a weekend and you want to like, blow your mind, that's Seaside like, Game. <laughs> Wasn't somebody starting a, a Ruby project to do something similar? Oh, or is that it's probably like all the PHP. I tried to do something in that once, and like after he'd been using Rails, we're like, oh yeah, it's Rails for PHP. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, when I first started looking at Ruby, this whole the whole Lambda thing just I was like, what? It, it, it was very confusing, but after using it, no, I think I think when they showed where it's like, this is a slot. That's like the best way to think about it, especially when you're starting. Yeah. If I could just pretend that this is a variable. Because yeah. you can. It's just right. hard to do. I, think I find it hard to do from scratch. I yeah, like to write two. How do you identify where those yeah, slots Yeah, I like to write two. Well, I remember like in a list book, it was like, if you ever write two functions, it's yeah. vaguely similar, just write a third that generates the two. Right. And that's how, I, that's how I usually work, is I usually try to like abstract those things and not try to like think of them before I even have them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Like, extract, extract, extract. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't want to do the same thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then you do, you end up with really like useful, flexible stuff like that. And the cool thing is, is that if you find, if you make an improvement on filtration down the road, then you just change it once. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It feels like every time. See, yeah. I'm not even an AP developer, but it's really cool. I, I like this, this approach. I, I can understand it right away as a non developer. I don't know why, but that's, I like it. So it's. I think it's easier, you know? And I think Ruby even makes it easier than something like this. Yeah. You know, the fact that there is syntax for it instead of the whole language having this. <laughs> the whole language is it. Yeah, like, God, yeah. I, I found it really confusing when it's like, I put a back tick to make it not, <laughs> right? Because it's like, don't interpolate and interpolate it as a variable. You guys ever read Paul Graham? Oh yeah. Sunshine. Yeah. He's like he really speaks highly of this. But I haven't really tried to try to do it for that project yet. Especially since we're using it. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alright, next.